Stop talking. Um, we're going to have some fun. We're going to do a lot of making today after we read the book. And um, yeah, uh, it's good to see you all again. Thank you, Francie. Thank you. And let's sing y'all down to the workshop. Is our time together for a time of stillness. It's a time when we can just say hello to our body, to our breath, to our being in the presence of this loving community. The reading this morning are quotes by Bishop Carlton Pearson, an evangelical Christian minister who was officially deemed a heretic in 2004 for embracing universalism. And I have to say, when I read this, it really put a lot of things in perspective for me. Fear of God creates more harm than good for the human race. God isn't angry with humankind, but because of erroneous concepts of God, most human beings are secretly angry with God. We do not need to be saved from God. We need to be saved from religion. We need to be saved from perceptions of God that portray him, in capitals, as an angry deity with a customized torture chamber called hell, managed by a malcontent called the devil, where we may be forever consigned because we didn't believe, didn't believe correctly, or didn't obey. I do believe in hell as a state of consciousness. And I believe that people can dwell in hell and that many do right now, today, on this earth, before rather than after death. I will argue that hell is the most erroneous, outdated, misunderstood, and mis misguided dogma in all of Christianity. When I say that God is not a Christian, I am saying that God is not limited as Christians have made him, capital H, to be. I need to say right from the outset that I no longer view God, view God as God or the God, but just God, not a he or a she, but more of an it, an infinite or ultimate creative intelligence, reality, or existence. God is neither religion nor religious. God is spirit. And now please rise as you are able and join me in singing hymn number 1040 in the Teal Hymnal, Hush.
Has anyone here ever attended an evangelical, Pentecostal, fundamentalist megachurch service? If you have, you would know that what Bishop Carlton Pearson preached at the turn of the 21st century was shocking and unnerving to his flock of then 6,000 followers. I will argue, Carlton Pearson later offers, that hell is the most erroneous, outdated, misunderstood, and misguided dogma in all of Christianity. Whoa. I mean, <laughs> whoa. Earth-shattering statement for this faith community and Pentecostal evangelists throughout the world, and something, frankly, that universalists have believed for centuries. A self-described fourth-generation African-American evangelical charismatic Pentecostal bishop with deep roots in and honor and respect for his community, Pearson went, in his words, from hero to zero. When he shared with all earnestness his universalist revelation, which he named the gospel of inclusion. After four grueling years of outrage and estrangement from colleagues, friends, media, and even family, this once highly revered megachurch preacher faced a modern inquisition in March of 2004. The Joint College of African American Pentecostal Bishops condemned his teaching as heresy, which led to a loss of his established ministry, foreclosure of the vast church campus, and a shunning from any official platforms of a faith that his family had followed for generations. Once named a heretic for universalist beliefs, he joined the august roster of forebears of our faith, who throughout the centuries were banished, exiled, imprisoned, and even burnt at the stake as a result of their convictions. Pearson believed that his revelation of universal salvation, and so the absence of eternal damnation, came as an epiphany from God. He had been watching a news segment about the 1994 genocide in Rwanda and the nearly one million brutal deaths of peoples from the Tutsi and Hutu ethnic groups. He could not reconcile that these people suffering in such harsh conditions were condemned to hell because they were not Christian. He sensed a divinely inspired voice within that claimed we are all God's chosen. It became instantly clear that we need to bring humanity and humankind together as one in spiritual consciousness of this gift of life. He then realized that eternal torment made no sense as a construction of a creative, loving God. All, no matter what religion, all could be eventually redeemed and made spiritually whole. Though some warned that he had heard the voice of the devil, he experienced a series of revelations over the next few years, which he shared in his book, The Gospel of Inclusion. Here are a few. God is neither religion nor religious. God is spirit. Preach goodness and graciousness rather than pettiness and wrath. Attract more. Attack less. Religion and scriptures are constructs by men seeking to know God in their own time and context. Being Christ-like doesn't necessarily mean being Christian. Neither Christ nor God is Christian. Compelled by this inspiration, he began to find in his research that the gospel of inclusion is an ancient truth known by others throughout human history. Staying to his Christian orientation, he discovered that universalism was indeed the more popular interpretation of Jesus' ministry for the first 200 years. 
He discovered Origen of Alexandria, a third century Christian scholar and respected advocate of universalism. Origen believed that all intelligent beings were created equal and good, but that some misused their free will and fell into sin. He believed that all souls could be saved. In souls, Origen wrote, there is no illness caused by evilness that is impossible to cure, for God is superior to all, end quote. Pearson found that it took yet another 250 years after that before Origen's teachings were treated as heresy to the orthodoxy. Holding on to this history, Bishop Pearson worked his way through the Bible to prove universalism to his peers and followers. But in doing this, he had to reject the angry God, the damning God, the tormenting and judging God. He realized his view of God could not be sustained by any one religion, that in fact religion, through its need to survival, often keeps people from communion with God. He recognized in this brave journey away from all that he once knew some more understandings that I'll quote here. We suffer from the delusion that we can anger God. God does not hold grudges. Sin is what we do, not who or what we are. Sin is not original. Only God is original. God needs us to be saved from ourselves, saved from religion, from the judgmental lifestyle to love style. This realization of the toxic tendencies of dogmatic religion was deeply concerning to him. He realized the devil he had preached about, admonished about, used as fear tactics, was not real. If there is a devil, he said, it is religion. Religion is in need of salvation. Religion is the plantation on which many people live as slaves or indentured servants under the manipulation of faith. Religion manufactures the conflict between God and sinner. He goes on, institutionalized religion has outlived its use, the big business of saving or getting saved from the wrath of God and the absurdity and vulgarity of eternal torture and punishment, end quote. This way of thinking was too earth-shattering a world and soul view for his followers. He was considered lost and mentally disturbed, then dangerous to be around as one who would encourage the sin of rejecting hellfire and damnation. People go through hell, he said, not to This changed his world internally, externally, financially, spiritually. Though estranged from his Pentecostal lineage, he had good company in our universalist forebears, who too suffered from various forms of rejection, exile and punishment, even unto death, for this simple belief that God is a loving God and all creatures originally blessed. George de Beneville discovered the danger of preaching the hope of God's love in France before he came to North America. His universalist preaching led him to the guillotine. He was pardoned at the last minute, actually on the cutting block with his hands tied. As soon as his prison sentence was over, he hightailed it to Germany, Holland, and then headed across the Atlantic to Philadelphia in 1741. Here's a bit of what he was preaching in 1740. The spirit of love will be intensified to godly proportions when reciprocal love exists between the entire human race and each of its individual members. That love must be based upon mutual respect for the differences in color, language, and worship, he wrote. We do not find those differences obstacles in love preach the universal and everlasting gospel of boundless universal love for the entire human race, 
he said, without exception, and for each one in particular. 1740. You might see how such thinking can be considered dangerous to the politically powerful. No more control through fear, no more diminishment by guilt, no more servitude, no more elite, less doubt of one's own ability to affirm life, less uncertainty of a way to be found toward wholeness. North American Christianity in the 18th century was infused with Calvinist doctrine, which centered on human depravity as a result of original sin. There was a doctrine of predestination which taught that being inherently sinful, few humans, only the elect, would be saved by God. And the church then provided the proper and possible ways of living and worship. The belief was that all people must behave as if they're saved or to be saved, but very few succeed because we are so flawed, so soiled, so far from God that we must discipline ourselves against most of human nature to have a chance at eternal life. Universalists, on the other hand, preached the gospel of God's success claiming that creation and its creatures were not created to be condemned, but to be cherished as precious gifts. They preached that the God of their understanding would not create such failures of being. And they preached in various visions of the ultimate that all beings can come into harmony with God. Centuries later, Carlton Pearson would call this irresistible knowing. People who hear the call to conscience follow what they know inwardly, he affirmed, what they know in consciousness or at higher levels of awareness. I call this irresistible knowing. It is a form of divinely transcendent memory. Pearson's revelation in response to seeing non-Christians suffer senselessly in Rwanda shifted the assumption that you can only be saved through his religion. This journey is a common one in the story of our forebears, usually witnessing the death and condemnation of loved ones. They simply could not accept that God would not accept these precious souls. And there are many other stories of people who emerged from pessimistic, legalistic faiths which denied humans their innate dignity. Many who found their voice first through doubt, then discovery that life offers goodness, and they had co-creative potential to manifest it in their lives. That the concept of eternal hell and damnation is religious bullying. Bishop Pearson eventually found solace in his colleague, Bishop Yvette Flunder, a United Church of Christ minister, who founded the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries in 2000. This is a trans-denominational coalition of Christian churches who desire to celebrate and proclaim the radically inclusive love of Jesus Christ. Pearson was welcomed to preach his gospel of inclusion at this fellowship, after which his newly formed friend, Bishop Flunder, said, if you are really an, inclusiveness, an inclusivist, then get ready, because we're coming. Eventually, Bishop Pearson was ordained as a United Church of Christ minister in 2006, finding one of his new avenues as an affiliate minister in 2008, at the All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In his 2018 sermon, To Hell with Hell, delivered at All Souls Unitarian in Tulsa, he lifted up that it takes a lot of guts for me to say that the God of the Bible is made up. Pearson gained attention as he traveled and spoke the gospel of inclusion. A 2018 Netflix movie was made to render his conversion journey. He got media interviews and wrote some books. There's a new curious audience out there, he said in an interview with UU World Magazine. There are millions of recovering evangelicals who have left the church and long questioned the concept of eternal damnation, saying, I know I'm not crazy. They cry when they tell me that. When you believe in hell, 
you create it for yourselves and others. Carlton Pearson died of cancer at the age of, no of 70 last November. He posted a final message on his weekly streaming consciousness video blog while in hospice. Know that I love you and I wanted you to hear from my own voice how deeply appreciative I am of who you are and that you are. Peace and blessings. Rest in peace, brave Carlton. So may it be. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 205, Amazing Grace. Please rise as you are able in body and spirit. Please be seated. Let's join our hearts in the spirit of prayer. <laughs> Great and magnificent, awe-inspiring, beyond our understanding presence of being. come to our knowing. Remind us of our beginnings. Help us see the glory of life in each one, sometimes lost and covered and distracted, but there, blessedly there, let us find it in ourselves and others. And let us be gracious about our brokenness. Let us be bold in our love. And let us find each other as co-wanderers in this spirit-led life. 
have a local prayer from Dottie. For my friend Chris, whose husband died suddenly last week. May love and strength and ease surround Chris. And for the generous and generosity of spirit of the caring committee, all the caring souls that help, it makes a difference. It brings us together. Thank you. And for all the prayers lifted up and unspoken, let us surround them in love. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, you know, just singing Amazing Grace, that song, oh my God, where did that come from? What a beautiful song. Um, my name is Carl Pastore, and I've been coming to First Parish with my uh, lovely wife, Lori, since about 2006. So, faith reflections, they're, they're, they're a little bit like jury duty, you know, you... <laughs> You, you know you have to do a specific <laughs> responsibility, but you try to get out of it. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, uh, Dottie Quinn has been tasked with recruiting people, <laughs> so here I am. <clears throat> Sorry, Dottie. I, I grew up Roman Catholic in East Boston, and at that time, my understanding of the word faith was you, you do what you're told. That's it. You, you don't question it. You just do what you're told. Um, and you just don't question it. Um, but I looked at some quotes, and uh, our friend Ralph Waldo Emerson stated that faith that stands on authority is not faith. That eternal optimist, uh, Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, said, um, faith is not wanting to know the truth. On the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, Helen Keller said, faith is the strength by which a shattered world emerges into light. So needless to say, for me, faith is confusing, contradictory, uh, it's, it's a tough subject. But in my, not, my 69 years now, my, my idea of faith in general is believing that, it, it, it's believing something with passion and conviction. Um, but it's also tied to good deeds and good works. If, if it's not tied to good deeds or good works, it's uh, kind of an ineffective faith in my mind. So I'm gonna keep it simple and give you a couple of examples of people in my life and outside of my uh, circle that help me better appreciate what faith is. My friend Father Mike, a Franciscan priest, who after leaving his East Boston parish, uh, has served the drug addicted and homeless in Kensington Avenue in Philadelphia. Now, some of you guys are nodding, you know where Kensington Ave is and what it looks like. It's like a, it's like a bigger, badder mass and cast. It's a really tough area. And he's been there for 30 plus years. Um, it's just astounding to me. Your father Mike told me he's committed 
himself to this work because his conviction, he has conviction and faith in the teachings of Jesus and St. Francis, that helping other people, uh, poor and destitute, is the right thing for him to do with his life. I think that's kind of faith there. My mom, who's 96 in a nursing home, she spends a big portion of each day praying. She's praying for people, family, friends, causes. Uh, she knows that praying helps. And uh, it's just something she's confident in. She has faith that praying helps, helps her son. She's always praying for her son. And other, other causes. You know, she's praying for certain things, outcomes of this election. She's praying for the people in Asheville. And, and so she's always praying. But her faith gives her that. Um, I have a new hero, and, um, and this was, I just heard about the late, the late Bishop Carson Pearson and Re Lisa's link. Never heard of him. And we just heard a whole lot about him from readings with Dottie and the sermon, the great sermon from Lisa. So someone who was, had it all together, was cool, fame, fortune, had everything, and he gave it up because he had faith, he had understanding that when he thought about inclusion about hell was the right thing to do so uh, astounding astounding people that have um, inspired me to do more which i need to do more finally the many of you in this congregation uh, you do it because it's the right thing to do not for recognition or rewards because it's the proper thing to do so keep the faith and keep on doing your good work thank you Carl, you're the poster child for faith reflections. I'll be coming after you later on in the, in the season. <clears throat> Today's offering will go to support the service and ministry of this church, showing our faith. To give, please follow the instructions printed on the laminated card in your pew or on the screen, the Zoom screen, or in the order of worship. If you are proud of this church, become its advocate. If you care about its future, share its, share its mission. We welcome all to build a just and healthy world with faith, love, and compassion. Please support our community by giving as generously as you can.
Now please stand and join me in saying the unison dedication, followed by the doxology, numbers four and three on your pew card. May these gifts be transformed into strength for this faith community, into comfort, food, and shelter for those in need, and may we be transformed by generosity. As I douse the flame from our chalice of faith, may the light of our faith burn deep and wide within us. May we take our blessedly invited selves into the world and find that peace and light and knowing we are all capable of. May we honor each other and honor this life. Have a good week. Amen. Tucker, are you still there? Your voice, your voice is off. What? I am yeah. still here. I am still here. Welcome. I just, I, 
I just want to say how beautiful you look today. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. And really, you. <laughs> really Madonna-like. And Well, it's like, I, I don't, you know, I'm not wearing these. For those of you in the gallery who don't know, I had cataract surgery <clears throat> last week. And um, I describe, I'm seeing so clearly I'm disoriented. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Um, my left eye, it's taken 10, 12 years to catch up to the right eye, which was done a long time ago. And um, it had deteriorated quite badly. And, you know, I think successful outcome. And, you know, I will always need to 